Welcome to Jurassic Park. Not even supposed to be here today. I'm just a fucked up girl who's looking for my own peace of mind. Welcome to the party, pal. I'll be back. I'll have what she's having. Death has come to your little town, Sheriff. You can either ignore it or you can help me to stop it. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close up. I'm your host Jim McLean. Welcome back to another episode of More Than Pixels on a Screen, a spoilerific movie review podcast brought to you by Banterflix Cinematic Discussion with a Northern Irish accent. So it is. That's us now. So it's another edition of the Ramble. It's a slight change of plan, listeners. I can hear Adam Neeson sign in sadness as he doesn't get to talk about Wild Wild West just yet. Just yet. We're going to keep the 99 year. To November. We're going to maybe do a lot of stuff throughout November for 99. Maybe a bit of election stuff. Something's happening in the US. I don't know. Is it a big deal? We'll find out after the election. But uh, I thought since we're into October and well into spooky season, we'd just focus throughout October on horror movies. But there is the small matter of our monthly ramble with an extra serving of custard. And, yeah, I thought that would be a perfect way to to kick things off. So joining me, as always, as we return to the studio, I think for the first time in nearly three months, maybe over three months, no more zoomy, zoomy nonsense, listeners. So joining me, as always, is my lovely co-host, Adam What's Happening. I love Joker Neeson. Dollop, dollop, what's happening? (laughs) Um, This is the first podcast I've done in months where I haven't been wearing pyjamas. It is, and Beetlejuice pyjamas. Yeah. They've, they've seen me through these last three months. <laughs> uh, they, they've got you through. And uh, we're, I'm not speaking to you on the at the on the Nostromo. Or where else was your little backgrounds on Zoom I got to watch? I was once on the Red Dwarf. Yeah. I was in the Millennium Falcon at one point, And I was also on the Nostromo. Yeah. And now you're just back in the sexy studio here in Belfast, joined by our guest this week, the lovely Dr. Nicole Hamilton. Hello, hello. Hiya, Nicole. We had you on the TV show this week. We had you talking about Joker, Folly Adieu. We'll talk about that <laughs> movie in just a moment. The main reason we wanted to get you, not that we don't love you and you're a lovely person, to, I guess, to have on the show, is because many moons ago, when we had you on for our striptease episode, you, you know, don't let Sharon, not Sharon Osborne. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, do you have a thing for Sharon Osborne? I do not, actually. No, no, no I'll be worried about that. But, yeah. you know, we'll not let Sharon Stone know. But you, you know, confessed your love. For, are we going to say Demi or Demi? It's Demi. Demi. That's how she says it. Yeah, there we go. Never has someone <laughs> looked at me, Adam, so glaringly over from across the other side of the table in the studio here. It's like, it's Demi, Jim. And that's how she wants to be called. She can be called whatever she wants. But we had a plan to have you on the TV show to talk about the substance. Then you were sicking a well. I was indeed. You were sicking a well, but you're better. Almost. So, movies we have watched. I know we're into October, but we're kind of talking September, October. Will we kick things off or we'll just get it over and done with and talk about Joker Folly? I do. We know we talked about it in the TV show. Nicole's busting to talk about it. She's really enthusiastic about it. She <laughs> loves it. Adam, Mr. Joker, I've got eight copies of it on Blu-ray, even the Steelbook limited edition. Did I like it? He's still not sure. But now we have Joker Folly Adieu. Right, Todd Phillips returns. Joaquin Phoenix is back as Arthur Fleck. He's joined by Lady Gaga as Lee. This Elseworld rendition of... of not Lady Gaga. This El- Elseworld... Kind of. Yeah, this Elseworld rendition of Harley Quinn. We have a few other new cast members as well. Colin Meany is in there. As, no, not Colin Meany, the other one. The other Brendan one with Gleason. the big head. <laughs> <laughs> the other one, not Colin Meany. Colin Meany, although I would have loved Joker Folly Jew more, that would have been the thing I'd loved if it had just been Colin Meany and Brendan Gleeson. Did I tell you about the Colin Meany movie I watched on Amazon where a plane crashes in the sea and uh, they're, they're like surviving in an air pocket but they can't into the water because they're sharks. I'm sold. Is <laughs> Brendan Gleeson... Is it Pen, sorry, is Brendan Gleeson or Colin Meany? Colin Meany. But is he, Colin Meany playing one of the sharks? No, <laughs> but here's the kicker, right? He's a security... He's like a uh, the bodyguard to like this here, like, girl, right? And he's like, oh, I'll take care of it. I'll dive into the water. And every time Colin Meany... Picture him in your head. <laughs> got it? Every time he dives into the water, 
his small four foot Asian body double <laughs> <laughs> takes over. Can't remember what it's called, but just look up Colin Meany's shark movie and you'll, you'll treat yourself. I'm I'm on board already. Nicole can't even wait. She's already Googling because no, she's like, I'm going to be watching this film tonight. So, yes, it's Brendan Gleeson, not Colin Meany. A few other new cast members in there as well. Will we play a little clip of this musical? Because that's <laughs> the, they don't want us to know, but it is a musical. So this is the follow-up to the 2019 blockbuster success hugely successful film and now we have them back as i say all our cast members so let's play a little clip of joker folly adieu when i first saw joker when i saw you and murray franklin the whole time i was watching i kept thinking i hope this guy blows his brains out And then you did. And for once in my life, I didn't feel so alone anymore. Forget your troubles, come on, get happy. Better chase all your cares away. Sing hallelujah, come on, get happy. So that's a clip of the movie. Adam, I feel I should come to you first because this has become a recurring joke, a running gag. Not that I would pull the arse out of any possible joke I could possibly think of, but regular listeners will know. You're still, what, five years on, Mm. not 100% certain if you like Joker or not. It kind of, this movie kind of kind of cements that idea. That, Did it, though? No, but it cements the idea that the first Joker actually isn't as bad as you think. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm with you. Yeah, not a very good movie. Like we said, we talked on the TV show about it, but I'll talk about some of the good things first. Um, set design and costume design, fantastic. I think it really represents the era that it's from. It's sort of late 70s, 80s. Um, I think it's the 83, 84, isn't it? 83, kind of? yeah, New York, and you kind of feel it. Sorry, uh, as I burp, by the way, in the background. The professionalism <laughs> that I brought to Zoom has has, has not returned as we come back to the studio. Um, I'll just take my charges off. Um, th- that's it for good? No, working for... Catherine Keener. Catherine Keener, yes. She's I there. keep forgetting she's in it because... Because she doesn't get anything to do. No, she sort of disappears. Imagine she had a musical number. She gets number. a kiss and then she leaves. Yeah, that's a weird one. Um, that was very strange. And uh, Alan Partridge turns up. Um, <laughs> oh being very partridge he does the I know it's an audio thing but he does the partridge <laughs> where he kind of like rolls his neck um, yeah Zazie Beats is back as well as everyone's favourite uh, Lee Gill as uh, Gary Puddles oh Gary Puddles oh fuck it, Gary Puddles Where Gary um, Wait, did we need the like camera position behind him the entire time he walks through the courtroom because up to it like Todd, just in case you forgot Todd Phillips can't help but make fun of either disabled people um, little people anybody with any sort of ailment uh, you know like we had to watch him struggle to get up on the wee seat that they made for him and everything and then he had to sit so... on a wee book with the yellow pages oh, no. as well um, it's Todd... there was it in my screen and there was a wee person when that happened not a wee person but there was a person who just went ah Jesus <laughs> <laughs> Todd Phillips everybody forgets the director of Starsky and Hutch in old school mm-hmm. you know he comes from that 2000s era of but Adam I quite like I don't like I don't love Starsky and Hutch I don't hate Starsky and Hutch mm-hmm. I have a soft spot for it because I like Ben Stiller mm-hmm. and I like Owen Wilson wow <laughs> and I thought that film for of that kind of that era of mm. when it was like let's go back to classic TV shows and remake them. Starsky and Hutch is not the best, but it's not the worst. And I am, even though a lot of you know, there's a lot of problems with old school. Mm. I love old school. You're my boy, Blue. <laughs> You're my boy. He's good comedy director. Yeah, he knows how to get things. But he also sorry, I'm here for the gangbang. <laughs> <laughs> the the tra- We're going streaking! The trailer moment from... Um, King KFC still open? The tra- Sorry, I'm going to stop. The trailer moment from The Hangover, whenever Bradley Cooper's character shouts through the window, paging Doctor mm. something, 
um, has aged like fucking sour milk that everybody has <laughs> farted in for the last 25 years. Um, Such a way with words, Adam. Yeah, I'm a wordsmith. You're a poet. Here, I'll tell you who's not a good writer. Todd Phillips. Because um, <laughs> this script is just, I talked about the telly show. There's no through line. You know, there's no like, because this happened, that happened, because this happened, that happened. This is just, this happens, this happens, this stuff. happens. Stuff. It's stuff. Yeah. And I can understand why people might, I know you enjoy it, Jim, but um, there's people who are like, this movie's a masterpiece. And I kind of feel like it's the people that didn't like the first Joker it's like the negative opposite of it, kind of. See, I, I kind of thought that that's how I would be because I really, really, really disliked the first one. And Can like, I ask what it was you really disliked about the first one? Please let me know because I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I didn't like the portrayal of mental illness. Um, I, I f- and I also feel like there's a way to like portray these things in a certain way whilst also making it clear that the movie doesn't think that. Mm. And... I just think that Todd Phillips doesn't have the capabilities to oh, totally to agree. do that, and I don't I don't enjoy it whenever things are just like completely derivative, without like doing something interesting with mm. it or like I don't know I just there's there's so many elements to it that just I was like I see the vision the vision has not quite gotten where you th- seem to think mm. that it's gotten to, um, the. I I am a big DC fan, mm. um, and I know that you are as well, um, Adam. Were you for the Snyder Cut? Yeah, yes. Oh, no. Wholeheartedly, genuinely, yes. <laughs> oh, no. Um, this friendship might not. Might I'm not go. sorry. It's back to Demi now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I get. I mean, I get why people aren't interested in that stuff. That's just it. It works for me, and I, like I'm not somebody who is like this has to be the way that I want it to be and it's the only way that it's allowed to be and blah, 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 blah. But you are. <laughs> Wee bit. Um, but one of the only things that I kind of like that DC's done over the last, like, 10 years or so, whenever they realised how badly they were fucking up, is the, like, the idea of Elseworlds. Yeah. Which I know is a, is a comic book thing. I know it's not um, specific to the to the films. But I, I do really like that concept of just like i'm not somebody who needs a cinematic universe i'm really happy to just like dip in and out of different things try uh different interpretations of characters it's just that this interpretation of joker does not work for me at all he's not what i personally find interesting about the character and he's also like he's not joker yeah like i know i know we're we will. So we always say there's we and on the the pod listens. There is spoilers. Mm-hmm. Will we will we get this out of the way? So if you haven't seen Joker, follow a duh, <laughs> I'd probably say stop listening and maybe go away, watch the film, come back, and if you're really annoyed and you're like fuck, it, all right, listen to the podcast. Where were they? They were talking about shiting themselves and talking about X Y Z. Right back to Joker. We'll just get it over and done with. So by the time this film reaches its revelation. The Joker we've watched for, what, four hours on this with all the makeup and everything X, Y, Z. It, it's not the Joker that ultimately will go on to become Batman's mm-hmm. nemesis. It's clearly being used as the inspiration that for the Joker that will ultimately become the, the clown prince of mayhem is, is, is inspired by Arthur Fleck. I kind of... <laughs> Because that idea was muted around from the first film mm-hmm. as well. It was kind of there, oh, well, what if this guy's not the Joker? And then even by the end of the first film, he even had a sense that, is this all this happening in his head? As the, mm-hmm. the final scene of the first movie, it's like, well, all this stuff we've watched, is it all in his head anyway? But by the time we reach this, whether, well, I mean, there still could be other interpretations. I don't think there's much there. I know there's some people are kind of, Send because it's like what you're seeing in front of the camera and what you're seeing in the behind of at the, the back of the scene is this potentially Heath Ledger's Joker? I don't think that is really the case, but we do see a bit of a, a Chelsea Chelsea yeah. Dagger, Chelsea Smile, Chelsea Smile, Chelsea Smile, Chelsea Dagger, terrible song by <laughs> the Fratellis. Mm. If I'm gonna say that right, there's me, that's why I'm not on top of the pops, they're the reference for the kids, <laughs> but um, we we see that in the background, um, yeah. <sighs> I, like you, was not a fan of Joker. Now, I've said this before on the TV show, and it's not me going, oh, we went to Venice. It's like, it was a case of, I had a, a, a bucket list of festivals I wanted to go to 
they foolishly accepted our accreditation. We went and got to go. It was like, right, I'm luckily was able to get tickets for the, the premiere of, of, of Joker. And I said at the time, in the room, watching the film and maybe just getting the end, getting caught up in that kind of 14, 15 minutes standing applause that film got. It's like, oh yeah, well, I wasn't quite certain. I was like, I was kind of let everyone else got up. I was like, kind of like, do I need to stand up here and clap? I don't know why I felt the need to get up as we record. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, I, I did like it. There's stuff I like and there's moments that I think visually, like there's even in this film, I know they re- replicate scenes. And I know Adam often takes the piss out that scene with Joker in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. I actually love... Can I say, in the second movie, the scene in the bathroom, when it, it shows you the aftermath of him washing mm-hmm. his face, that's my favourite scene. I, I thought that scene was genius yeah. in the second film. Yeah. I, I do love that sequence. I think that goes down for the score, which I'll come back to from the first film, which is kind of... It's still here. It's the same composer. Apologies. I don't have her name to hand. And I know I was looking at it down. I was trying to write it phonetically. I don't want to butcher it. But the, the score... It won an Academy Award, didn't it, for, the, for that score? I mean, it's a great score for Joker. And second time round, it's used sparingly. But as I say, when I watched the Joker, even at the first time I seen it, it was like, did I really love that? It's like, it's a pretty good film. It's like, and the whole, the slow version of Sending the Clowns and stuff. It's like, yeah, and I remember the whole moral panic, a bit like, uh, I was going to say Fright Club, a bit like Fight Club, when it was released, this sense of like this anti-hero and this anti-establishment figure and this idea, like you alluded to, Nicole, of what happens when those people in society that we marginalise and we don't listen to and we victimise and we leave them in a position where they they feel isolated, that they have no other opportunity to do what they do. All that stuff's there and you're like, I think it's at face value. It's skin deep in that depth of what it's trying to do. And then about three, four weeks later, Movie House, Dublin Road, RIP, lovely cinema, and came back, watched it, and just watched with a different audience, completely different film. I was like, this is long, plodding, boring, great performance by Joaquin Phoenix. I said it on the TV show, if it made the cut. I still think if you want to watch that film, watch... Um, I don't know if I get the title right. It's like, it's either I was never really here or you were never really here. You were never really you were here. You were never really here. So I think I got Lynn, it right on the Lynn television. Ramsey them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lynn Ramsey? Yes, Lynn Ramsey. Brilliant film and brilliant performance, performance by Joaquin Phoenix in that I don't know, Joker, I, I've always been like, it just wears all its things you've mentioned, Nicole. And then there's all of the use of the Scorsese King of Comedy, Taxi Driver, and it's all from the face value. And the people, I hate being that I'll fart. And I did it today, I did it today, earlier today, before we started to record, because we were talking about it on cue. And they were talking about Joker and this terrible ratings that it's getting, and people are walking out of the film. And I went in, I said, look, I don't think it's the worst film I've seen all year. I mean, I've seen worse films. I will see worse films before Christmas. I guarantee you. I mean, we've still got the Terrifier 3 to come. <laughs> but I, just, I, I went in with zero expectations. But these people that are reacting in this way, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I lost my train of thought. I, I bore myself by this. Because I was talking about it today in Q and talking about Joker Folly Do and talking about how people hate it. And I was like, I don't mind. And I was in all these people going, oh, I love the first one. I was like, why don't you watch King of Comedy? Never heard of it. And I hate being that person going, why don't you watch on Disney Plus? It's pretty much the same film, except you've got Robert De Niro in the Joker role and you have Jerry Lewis. I hope you get cancer. <laughs> uh, it just in the in the Murray role that De Niro plays in Joker. Watch, if anything, I, I'm, I bore myself. Anyway, I'm digressing. Watch... King Comedy, if you love Joker. So now we have Folly Adieu. And you on the TV show, Nicole, really didn't like it. No. You really didn't like it. And I mean, not I mean, you kind of said you thought the film's producers, the, the director, Todd Phillips, even the actors, I don't want to say ashamed, but they haven't seemed to want to talk about the fact that it's a musical. No, even Gaga, who you would assume if anybody's going to be quite loud and proud about it being a musical, that it would be her. But even in an interview, and I'm assuming that this is just like the statement that they've all collectively agreed to say, because I think I've seen Todd Phillips say something very similar about, I think she said that they are using song to convey emotion 
rather than it being a musical and I really just wanted to shake her and be like but that's what a musical is it's literally the point of a musical but yeah I don't know it's weird that they seem to be hiding it now I was wondering about this I mentioned this again when I was talking about it in Q I said it seems to be of late films don't want to tell you that they're musicals I was thinking about Mean Girls the musical Mm -hmm. it's a a big screen adaptation, okay, I know it went to... Well, it, it was cinematically released. I think it was originally just go to Paramount+. Plus, mm-hmm. But it's like, it's based on the stage play of the musical stage play of Mean Girls. So it's Mean Girls the musical, the, the stage play, of course it's going to be a musical. And there's hardly any reference to the fact that it's musical and advertising. And so many films. I remember the other one I've, I've talked about, lovely, like Sweeney Todd, that's going back a few years ago. Wicked this Christmas. Yeah. yeah. Has been slightly like that's not a musical. It's just Wizard of Oz guys. Come on in. I think they've they've started to show a wee bit more of the musical numbers in the trailers, and you can hear the like Defying Gravity note yeah. in it. That's like really famous. I just don't understand but, why films are ashamed of a genre that I think is fab. It's also a genre that makes a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like I worked in the movie house for a while, and there was that. Tina Turner, no, not Tina Turner. Um, uh, I wanted, to, I wanted, yes, I wanted yeah. to dance with somebody. Yeah. That was sold out for weeks. Mm-hmm. That's a fucking terrible movie, yeah. but nobody it's, cared. They get a demographic that I feel like don't often show up to like sell out the theaters. Mm. Like usually, whenever you think of 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 like a big blockbuster that's gonna you're gonna have to book tickets for in advance, you're thinking like a superhero movie or something. Mm. And then Mamma Mia two mm. comes out mm. and. Yeah. It's like the same sort of hype, so it's it's not like the audience isn't there. Yeah. It definitely is. Like Rocket Man but... as well made a yeah. shitload of money. Yeah. Oh, and I know that like kind of the Bohemian Rhapsody wasn't really a musical. I mean, it's just really a showpiece of of certain musical sequences of certain Queen songs, and then it just descends into Live Aid. It wasn't really a movie either. No, <laughs> no. well, well, not about. But Rocket Man is. I mean, Rocket Man. It's yeah. fair to say is a musical. Oh, it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. It's an absolute fab film by Dexter Fletcher, and yeah, they make money, and I never get why studios of late. I was like, oh, we're, we're doing a musical. I was like, well, why be? ashamed or backhanded about it I think they're kind of giving you the position as like they've decided to do something which I think I actually think is quite clever in what they're trying to do but then they're ashamed of it and they don't want to tell you because it's like well teenage boys won't go to a musical I think okay I get that but if you're going to do that then why if you're going to be if you if you if you're ashamed of that why do it and I don't I don't I think there's intriguing ideas in this film. So, my thoughts on Joker, I think it's fine. I think it's because I went in with zero expectations. I am someone who takes perverse pleasure in other people's suffering. And there was about 15 people walked out of the screen and I was in, at least, at Lisburn. And everybody was either tutting or there was two guys sitting in front of me who had about the eighth song in the movie say, is this a fucking musical? It's like, I just wanted to reach in between them in the cinema scene. Go, yeah, it is, guys. Sit there and then just take it all in. And they're like, fuck this. They left, I think, about half an hour before the end. They're like, fuck, I don't mind if we leave. Do you want to leave? Fuck it, let's go. I, I, I don't know. I, my problem with this, it's the same with Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Adam, I know we had you on the pod talking about it and you were more enthusiastic about it m- than me. Mm. My problem with Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, and I don't know, Nicole, if you've seen it or mm-hmm. if you're a fan of it. Structurally, yes, it's got all the things. We love practical effects. We have Michael Keaton, we have Tim Burton. But structurally, it's a mess in the sense that it's built around this idea, that idea. And there's all different things going on within the film. I'd just rather have a structured narrative. And here, you've alluded to this, Adam, it's this idea, this little bit, or this scene. There's a dream sequence. There's a musical number. There's the the court stuff in the courtroom. There's the stuff in the prison, and they don't work. And I think, as as someone who loves musicals, the big thing you've got to do is you have to be able to get through with your cast in front of the camera with a straight face, if you so wish. It doesn't necessarily, if you think of Mamma Mia get your cast from being able to talk as we are now and go and hire you to Sunday. I want to get a pencil, but I don't know where my pencil case is. And then go out of that musical number with a straight face. And I don't think 
it works here in the sense of what they're trying to do. It's as you say, it's they've been able to express themselves and deal with trauma and using musical as a way to address that interesting idea. But a bit like what you said and with, with Joker, Nicole, it's all at kind of face value out. And then when you carry on with it, I don't think it works. I mean It it feels it all almost all of the musical numbers, it feels like everybody's holding back. It feels like they're not they're trying not to go full musical. Did you find um, it hard to realise what the songs were? I had no idea most of the time. Yeah, like there's there it's a jukebox musical, so mm. it's songs that we already know. But it takes you about a minute in before you go, Oh fuck, yeah. it's this song. And it's, whenever it's I did song? like there was a couple of songs whenever I did eventually realise what they were, I was like not actually singing in the cinema, obviously, but like under my breath was kind of like. Were you? Did you have full Joker makeup and just dancing around the <laughs> yes, place? Yes, I did. Um, just going right. Da, da, da. <laughs> but like that for me, that's half the fun of of watching a jukebox musical is getting mm. to like hear songs that you recognise and have a good time with them, even if they're slightly redone or whatever. Mm. But with this, I was just like, I don't know what you're singing. I have no idea what's going on. Why are you not giving a wee bit more? Mm. I'll, I'll I'll tell you what was good though, the opening cartoon. Oh, yeah, I like that. Yeah, the opening cartoon because again, it's the idea of this duality of persona mm-hmm. in the sense that there's Arthur Fleck and there's Joker, and they kind of run with this quite a bit. And then we've already kind of alluded. I th- I think personally, a lot of the negativity towards this film. Yes, people don't like the musical aspect, but I think there's a sense of. Possibly, people feel that their time has been wasted by the fact that, as we've already mentioned, this is not the Joker. Mm. This is somebody who calls himself the Joker, uses the makeup. He killed six people. Is that as well? Five people? Is it five people, five including people his, his mum? Mo- six, including his mum. Including his mum <laughs> in the first film, which I'd forgotten that he had killed his mum in the first film, and he's on. He's up for on up for murder or up for murder and all facing the death penalty and by the end of the film I know we're in spoiler territory he denounces that there is no Joker there is just Arthur Fleck and I think uh, as we've already mentioned as well then on the very final scene Arthur is killed by another inmate who the whole way through the film there was two things because I knew there was controversy about the ending and because we're on yeah, that when you know about that, you're kind of like, oh, what's this M Night Shyamalan a <laughs> ding dong twist going to be? Is Lady Gaga a fiction of his mind? And there was a sequence very early on where they have sex, and she suddenly ends up in a cell. It's very awkward. And that, was, that was terrible. It's a very it's like, can you put it in? All right, no bother, Gaga. But <laughs> um, is is this going to be another? Uh, Zavi Beats, isn't Zavi Beats? Yeah. Uh, from the first film, where she is both real and fictitious. And then they keep talking about a TV movie. Mm-hmm. And it's like, is there going to be the final reveal? Is this is the crap TV movie uh, that we're yeah. watching? Is that I kept thinking about that. But also, there's constant cutaways in the prison of another inmate. And there's constant talk of Brendan Gleeson, not Colin Meany, Mm-mm. talk of, oh, he come in, he just won't stop smiling. You're like, oh, fuck. And there's a sequence... They're watching the TV and it cuts and they're all looking at Arthur and then it just for no apparent reason just cuts to this inmate. It's like, are they going to go down this that this guy's the Joker? And I know in DC we have the three Jokers. Are they going to explore that idea? I know there's kind of more to it in with with the three Jokers. But with the three Jokers in a cinematic universe, it's sort of like Nicholson, the, the cool, <laughs> suave Joker. You've got the uh, Heath Ledger, Heath Ledger, nine eleven terrorist S Joker, and then you've Arthur Fleck, the man that's gang raped and stabbed to death in a jail. Mm. You're like, mm. did, did, did. loved you didn't the fact that you didn't mention Jared Leto. <laughs> Who? <laughs> um, I think Todd Phillips being Todd Phillips, making him so pathetic is Todd Phillips being like, I'll be funny. I think it's him just being like, but but what if he gets diddled by the guards and then he gets killed? Would not be a laugh. <laughs> do, you, do you think there's a sense, and we talked about this, I'm going to bring it back because we talked about this with Doctor Who. Are you a Doctor Who fan? I am. So did, are you caught up with the latest series? I'm not. I haven't watched it like, I'll shoot get properly in cry in every episode. One single tear. <laughs> but it's a bit like the revelation here is a bit like of what we have, the revelation with Ruby. 
Sunday. Sunday. Is that right? Ruby Rose? Ruby no. Rose. No, Whatever. not Ruby Rose. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, Ruby that's, Tuesday. That's something different. <laughs> Ruby when? Uh, Ruby Sunday. It Ruby, is Ruby Sunday. Sunday. It is Ruby Sunday. Because the new uh, apprentice, the new companion, <laughs> is called something Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> Monday, Tuesday. Tuesday night, who stars in um, Nightmare on Elm Street 4. Jim, stop me. Help. Oh. <laughs> well... You know what I'm. You'll know what I'm talking about. So it, the the revelation here, it's one of those difficult things to get off to to kind of pull off in that sense. Yep. You, you <laughs> where you probably sit there and you go, "This is quick. Oh, this is clever. Oh, this is going to be brilliant." Realizing that you're just going to fuck people off in the sense that I come back. I'm like, you've wasted four hours. I think the first film's over two hours. Mm. This is just over two hours. You're going to have wasted people's time. It's like, so your film's called Joker. This one's Joker Folly. Why? Why? He's not the Joker. I don't know. Do you, do you know what I mean, though, in that sense? It's it's a difficult... I think... Do you think... I, I just think Todd Phillips would be sitting there going, this is such a clever idea. I, yeah, I think he thinks that it's mm. really smart to, like, pull the rug from under you yeah. after two movies. For me, personally, I don't really mind because he's not, like, what I envision joker as a character to be you love so, the jared leto one no <laughs> i fucking hate it all them wee nappies just uh, there just for the crack um actually i don't even know i'm i'm not a huge joker fan in general as a character cesar like, romero's isn't cesar romero's cameron monaghan oh yeah he was all right mm. mark hamill i do like mark hamill a lot actually i'm tim more curry. of an animated mm. um what? tim curry he was the joker until he deleted all of his lines <laughs> do you remember it <laughs> mm. That, I, I actually would pay good money to see. You can hear it. It's on YouTube. Yeah, is it? Yeah, mm-hmm. he was <gasps> original. He was the original before Mark Hamill took over. Oh, I didn't know that. Tim Will Curry we play was a little clip of that just for Nicole now. Let's Please. go, gang. So there you go, Nicole. There's Tim Curry as a Joker. You didn't know there's something. You I got had from no this idea about that actually. Yeah, no. I do really like Mark Hamill. I'm more of an animated Joker fan. I don't. I do like Heath Ledger a lot, mm-hmm. but I'm not a. I think this is probably one of the reasons why I don't like Joker the film very much. Is I'm not a huge extremely realist Batman fan. Did, did you also hate Heath Ledger's Joker because there was men, including myself of a certain age, just after The Dark Knight was released, just kept walking around everywhere going, why so serious? A lot of lick-lipping. <laughs> lick-lipping. <laughs> lip, lip licking. Six. <laughs> Frank Thick, Batman. Uh, Heath Ledger, R.I.P. Uh, I... I I confess, I love his Joker. He's great. He is very, very good. Yeah. But I, in general, like, I'm not a huge Dark Knight trilogy person just because, like, for me, I'm just like, this is a man who's dressed up as a big bat. Mm-hmm. I, I don't need it to be really, really serious. Like, like my personal... We should have had you on the Batman Forever. I was literally but... thinking about oh, I do like Batman yeah. Forever a lot. But my, my, like, perfect... Hey, Nicole, next year we're going to be talking about Batman and Robin. You're going to join us? Yeah. Yeah, happy days. <laughs> of course I will. That's a date. Joel Schumacher, yes. Yeah. Um, Batman Returns is my, like, number one aesthetic kind of tone. Mm-hmm. Like, absolutely ridiculous, but really dark at the same time. Jim, we both know why. Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, yes. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah. At least you're honest. She was actually like one of my very first crushes in my entire life because of Grease too. So. Yeah. So, okay. so that uh, makes another sense. Another classic musical. Another yes. rated musical. Extremely underrated. No, we're opinion. talking about jukebox musicals just because the way my mind works. One that a lot of people hate that I absolutely love. And maybe it's because I do love the man that just likes to run on camera. Does any, either of you like Rock of Ages? I've never seen it. Apart from some of its problematic cast, yes, it's actually not bad. Apart from the fact, well, there's two. Yeah. Well, now and they're Baldwin, both in each, each other's scenes. Yeah, you can cut that out. Alec Baldwin and um, Russell, Wibbly Wobbly Russell Brand. Russell Brand. There we go. Is Tom Cruise in it? Yeah. yeah. He plays the rock star. He's oh, kind yeah. of playing kind of Axl Rose kind of. Yes. He's great at all. Yeah. He's fab in it, and they do a great. Uh, is it a Journey song? Um, do not don't stop believing. Any way you want it. Um, oh, that's a in a in a strip club. Thing is great on it. Uh, Catherine Zeta Jones. Yes, she plays like a Bible bashing. Catherine Zeta Jones is she's it? fantastic in it. I, I have been Sold. I have been busting to see the stage play off it. I've been. My mom's seen it. She really and likes it. I've heard only good things. And I went to see the film. I have not known anything about it on the fact there's Journey songs in it. I love Journey. And uh, I absolutely had a ball. I remember 
at the time it was press screened, I give it like a five star review. <laughs> and everybody was like, what the <laughs> fuck were you on? But I've also given some um, generous reviews in my life. Like Joker 2. Yeah, <laughs> Joker 2. It's all right. It's <laughs> fine. I come, I just, I think there's an interest and idea within Joker and having the guts, the stupidity to try and do something like that with a DC licensed character, like an IP, I hate saying that phrase, with Joker, trying to do something a bit weird and out there. Like I think I can imagine it working in a comic, but then I suppose then how would you really get the music that you'd have mm. other than the fact the way it would work? I can imagine someone doing a really good comic, a one shot comic in this idea and kind of like the kind of the Buffy series that ep- the musical episode yeah. where everything everyone's singing through I'm sure maybe over the years they've done something like that I mean I know wasn't there the, the Batman silent or I don't know that was the Batman black and white mm. and stuff like that there's the Brian Azzarello Joker series which is a oh, little bit more yeah. realistic yeah um, I I think there's an interest and idea I just come back to my problem structurally and how it's been put together it's Bits and pieces of ideas, like I, I said this in the TV show, from my understanding, feel free, both of you, to correct me if I'm wrong, the genesis for this, because Joaquin Phoenix, I think, wasn't that interested in coming back until he apparently he had a dream where he was watching his version of the Joker sing to him from the stage. And he was like, oh, Todd Phillips, that's interesting. They, they played about and come up with that idea. I think it's a good idea. Because the musical sequences all take place in Joker's head. Yeah. Why can't he dream that he's a better singer than he is? <laughs> That's the weirdest thing to me. I think if they went, like Nicole, you talked about in the TV show, if they went more bombastic, if they went more Bob mm. Fosse with it all, I think you probably would, it would have been more of a crowd pleaser and you kill, mm-hmm. you, you could have still had your cake and eat it of being like, well, that's, because it's the juxtaposition of his mind being so big and then coming down to the reality, you could have done a big, 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 and then when he's in the courtroom and they're like, "Oh, you're getting sentenced to death," he goes, "Oh fuck!" Like it, it's like it takes that sort of motivation or like revelation in his life to be like, "Off, oh, it's not all fucking," you know, because you could have fed off the first movie where he has got famous for doing such a thing, like a big act. Yeah. So it's it's carried on and he thinks he's a big shot because, you know, mm. people in, in the Arkham could have been like, hey, he's the Joker, hey, even the guards. They Do you kind know of what, though? I, you're talking about that. There's, isn't it the Saints are coming? Yes. Sequence mm-hmm. where they, they all kind of, you see him coming back after the big hurrah in the courthouse. And I actually quite like that sequence. Yeah. When you see him again, he's this scrawny, he's like um, Christian Bale and The Machinist. He's mm-hmm. so scrawny and skinny. And it's just this look of sheer glee as this chaos that he's created as he comes back and they all start singing one by one, the Saints are coming. Not mm-hmm. the Green Day version. And you, the Green Day and U2, U2 version, we should say. Like, how much would you have loved to have seen Nicole, Lady Gaga, in sweet charity mode, marching down the street with a marching yeah, band? That would have been really, really good. But instead, we got Joker getting fingered in a bum. <laughs> <laughs> One that you mentioned that one musical number, I think you, you've talked about the sequence, the aftermath of that toilet sequence. Ooh, sounds a bit weird saying <laughs> it like that. Um, from the first movie, is your standout? I think I agree with. You. I think that's mm-hmm. fab that sequence because that's kind of near the end of the film. He's listening to someone else, basically getting killed. Yeah, off camera, um, by Brendan Gleeson, not Colin Meaney. And you see him then, there's this moment, and that leads to his his revelation that he's, he, I'm Arthur Fleck, there is no Joker. Mm-hmm. But um, there's the sequence in the courtroom where it's like, I think the song's the real Joker. Mm-hmm. And I loved it. I thought it was very, actually what it reminded me of, as someone who's sad and does love you too, and bought the soundtrack for the ill-fated Spider-Man Turn Out the Dark, I think it was, oh, yeah. Broadway. Mm-hmm. I have that CD. It, it sounds like something you would see on Broadway if they were doing, let's do Batman the musical. You would do something like that. I thought it was fab. There's individual bits. I, I sit there going, that's fab. And then there's other bits you go, that just doesn't work. It's just drawn out, 
The worst thing I can say. I always remember Gavin Moriarty was on this pod. And he always talks about, you know, his time is precious. I'm not that in, way inclined. But I'll always say the worst thing a film can do, it's not if I love it or hate it, but if I'm bored. Mm. And I can't deny, as much as I thought, it's fine. I was bored at times during Joker Folia. Mm. Sorry, Joker, Joker. <laughs> Folia, yip, 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 yip. <laughs> the, uh, Adams in his PJs. As soon as the first sort of musical sequence where they're both on the rooftop, Mm. As soon as that didn't play out in a long shot, mm. I thought, uh-oh, we're in trouble here with the rest of these musical sequences. Because you had the two of them dancing beautifully mm. together, singing beautifully, chopped chopped up for no reason. It's a bit like Taken 3. Too yes. many <laughs> jump cut jumps. And you just want, it's like analogy here for me, for the kids. It's, well, it is. I mean, kids watch Strictly Come Dancing. It's like when you're watching Strictly or something like that, and it's like, hold the camera back. Let me see them dancing. Don't switch to that camera, switch to that camera. Totally agree. When there's too much going on, when it's over-edited, it's weird though, because there's other times it looks stunning. Yeah. I mean, I think it's Chicago, is it, they're using again as Gotham? Because mm-hmm. that's kind of going back to the Christian, not the Christian Bale, but the Chris Nolan, where they use Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the stunnings, I think it was shot with IMAX cameras. It was, yeah. They look fab. It's just a shame. As you say, there's other moments where they feel the need to jump, 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 change. Which is it's frustrating. Yeah. And it's it's the sequel we could have had if the filmmakers were more interested in actually making a sequel. It feels like it's forced into reality. Um and it maybe could have been cooking for another couple of years, maybe could have thought of something a bit yeah. different. But I think maybe with the new regime of James yeah. Gunn coming in with DC, they were like, oh, I don't want to fucking really push the boat here because mar- the marketplace is going to get too muddled with too much shit. Yeah, there's too many. I mean, we now have, we now have a, a Batman that's an, an Elseworld, mm-hmm. technically. I did think at some point they might combine those two, but then Robert Pattinson is is too young and we have a Joker in that universe already with Barry Keown. Hey, after watching this movie, maybe he's not the real Joker. Who knows? be quite happy about that actually because I didn't like that we no. glimpse of him in the Batman you didn't like our Barry no I'm I Barry annoys me mm. I don't like his face there I'd give him a big kiss I would not I'd give him a wee kiss I always remember I did a red carpet for it was the Chris Nolan Dunkirk he was in mm-hmm. oh. and everyone rocked up at Dublin at the lighthouse in suits and he just rocked up in a wee kappa <laughs> track suit I was like Barry you're keeping it real I think I told him that's like you're keeping it real and he's just thinking like, <laughs> and it's like cheers no bother Barry anyway that's enough of me trying to drop names in so um, yeah I think mixed feelings I know we're going to move on but I think it's on that point I think I made this in a TV show and I'll be interested to see what you both think of this this is proof of and I know it happens more times than enough first film huge massive box office success. I think this is the most successful R-rated, R-rated, R-rated yeah. movie along the, or, uh, I don't think it's the most successful comic book but the most successful successful R-rated movie of all time. What is? The Joker. Joker? No, I think Deadpool it, took it over. Yeah, I think it was uh, until a few months ago. The other uh, uh, masterpiece of the year. I stand, <laughs> I stand corrected. Well, it was a hugely successful movie and it's proof that you don't always need a sequel. No. As, I mean, as as flawed as I think the first Joker was, and I go, just watch The King of Comedy instead. You've got Martin Scorsese directing and doing his thing. Well, in Joker, you've just got Todd Phillips going, this looks a bit like The King of Comedy. This looks a bit like what Marty would do. It is funny that we all came out of it being like, it's The King of Comedy, and then we all joked, oh, the second one's going to be like New York, New York, mm. and then it wasn't. No, it's Todd <laughs> Phillips trying to do his own thing, and then you see what a shallow filmmaker Todd Phillips mm. is. Yeah. But yeah, I know we're going to move on. Another perfect point of something, just can we not just go back to one and done? We don't always have to automatically have a sequel. Uh, I guess so, but we just don't live in that world anymore. If the the facts are true that they're going to, or the facts are true, the <laughs> words, if the rumours are true that um, they're going to bring in focus groups to fix these IPs, do you oh, read this? Mm. Yeah. Um, then we're probably not going to see. Uh, you know what? We're going to talk about the substance soon. And the substance is doing incredibly well. Mm-hmm. I think audiences have spoken, and this is really the final nail in that coffin of the IP war that 
people want something new people want something fresh and ho- studios are going to learn the wrong lesson from this unfortunately because they always fucking do but there's a wave people we talk about new hollywood there's a new new hollywood wave coming i suspect and joker 2 will go down as one of those movies as the end of an era of filmmaking before we move into another new era Mm, that's a lovely i don't know if that's downbeat or possibly you know the shit will come and then the good will come from the shit well you know i think i was quite hopeful yeah doesn't really matter, we'll still be watching all this. <laughs> yeah. Either good or shite, we'll be here to watch it. Hopefully, you know, maybe in about 20, 30 years, Todd Phillips will make Megapolis. I can never say the name of the movie. Megapolis? Megalopolis 2. Here, at least that tried. I Have you have you seen it? Yeah. What, what's the verdict? It tried. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet, I'm debating whether or not I'm... I think it's worth it. I would like to see it for Aubrey Plaza. She's great. Okay, there we go. Uh, Plasma Wow? What's up? No, Platinum Wow? Fantastic. <laughs> I'm, I'm intrigued to say because I'm surprised it's getting such a release in like non QFT art house cinemas. Mm. I, I think whether it's getting bums on seats is probably another thing, but uh, I know it's playing at my list for nominally plex, and I debated whether to go see it uh, as part of a double bill with Joker. And then I came out of Joker Follow Joe and I'm like, nah, I'm just going to go home. I seen it in the IMAX with about four people. Okay. And that was the IMAX, <laughs> which is usually sold out. Yeah. So I can't, I don't expect that the local um, IMC in Ballymena mm. <laughs> is packed out for mega apples. So do you want to, just before we move on, we've kind of talked at nauseam about Joker. We are going to move on. Do you want to share a little bit of thoughts, a little bit more thoughts about Megalopolis? <laughs> I can't say it. I'm sorry. Do you want to give me... Um, I think Francis Ford Coppola is an incredible filmmaker and the fact that he's put money behind this will not talk about what, what he got up to on set and all of the, yeah. the drama so there. So did he sell a vineyard to fund, fund this? Yes, he yeah. did, yeah. And I think, like I say, with the new Hollywood coming, you know, you have the old guard still making their movies and you would never have somebody new now come in with such a... F- uh, a fresh take on something whether you like that or not you know it tries something new and you can only applaud them for that is it a good film not particularly is it stunning to look at sometimes is it a bit of a clusterfuck 100% um, and without it, going into spoilers because I know there's a whole thing at can there's certain moments in the film Yes. How are they handling that on the theatrical release? It's sort of just piped in. Somebody asking the question sort of just piped in from... Are you disappointed someone from Sydney World didn't want to come out with a pre-prepared script? Out of the four people on the screen, (laughs) if they came in and be like, Adam, do you want to do it? I happily would have stood in front of the screen. Yeah, I'm I'm going to say it before it goes out of cinemas. I feel by the time this episode is up, on our feed, it may be out of cinemas, and I'm I'm looking for because Francis Ford Coppola, I mean, not only The Godfather, Apocalypse Now, where I know he kind of burned himself out on, but just the conversation because mm-hmm. it was back in cinemas. I got to see it on the big screen again. Just such a fantastic piece of cinema that he made in between The Godfather and Godfather Part Two mm-hmm. as a bit of a kind of. You know, to, to clear his head, this was an idea. You've got one of the greatest actors of all time, Gene Hackman. Just, I fucking love the conversation. There, if you take anything from this pod, watch King Comedy and the conversation. So that's Megapolis. No, I can't say it. Megalopolis. Megalopolis. I, I just, can't say it. I just want to throw in too, uh, Adam Driver, he is the king of working with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and it's another little scratch at his bedpost to be like, Francis, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Adam Driver, I don't mind. I think he gives incredible performances in stuff like Silence Mm. and also Logan Lucky. (laughs) (laughs) Go from one extreme to another. But this then brings us... So you're talking about interest in New Phillips. So the substance is without a doubt in that category. Another film I know in Boston to see, I don't know if either of you have seen it yet, is A Different Man, Sebastian Stan. Oh, I'm Boston to see it as well. I'm Boston to see it. I think it was James Oliver. I think I'd put up a, a positive review on his Instagram. I'm tempted to go see it. I mean, I, I, I'm i just intrigued by the concept. Interest and ideas. But, Nicole, we thought we'd have you on for The Substance because we were going to have you on a TV show talking about that. And as then it was related to you, you were sicking it well. Mm-hmm. 
So we thought, no, we have just come from the recording. You don't want to go home just yet. You'd rather talk about Demi Moore and Margaret Qualley and how we can have younger versions of Demi Moore looking like Margaret Qualley and injections in no way remind us of Reanimator and all that <laughs> kind of Brian using a horrible, gloopy, Cronenbergian body horror. So we're going to talk about that film. I think before we get into talking about the substance, I think we'll play a little clip. Have you ever dreamt of a better version of yourself? Younger, more beautiful, more perfect. One single injection unlocks your DNA, starting a new cellular division that will release another version of yourself. This is The Substance. So that's a clip of The Substance. Nicole, you have been very excited about this. Mm -hmm. The reason why we did our Strip Tease podcast with yourself was because we were coming back from the, the TV studio. We, I think, had just had, had the Cannes Film Festival or the lineup had been revealed and you were talking about your excitement of seeing Demi Moore in a genre horror movie. That was then. We've done our little Strip Tease podcast where we got a lot of things out done. Not all, everything, right, thankfully. But now we have the substance. You've seen it. Yes. Now's your chance. What do you think of the film? I really liked it. I didn't love it as much as I wanted to. Like, I kind of went into it hoping that it was going to be my favourite film of the year. And it's not. It's it's high up there, but it's it's really only that last like, half hour that kind of propelled it into, like, really, really good for me. Um, I think to be more fantastic in it. Um, I kind of wish that she was in it more than she is. Mm. Um, I really do like Margaret Qualley a lot, um, but I struggled a bit with the Sue parts of the film a wee bit more. It is kind of um, confuddling because there's this constant reminder there is no you or them, there is just one. Yeah. But then as a sense, if they're both the same person, are they having shared... They're different... But they don't, they don't remember what the yeah. other one's done. Yeah. And they are like fighting with each other even though they're meant to be the same person. Yeah. Until obviously you get to the end whenever they are merged as one and then merged, but yeah, I I struggled with with Sue a little bit just because I found her a little bit less interesting, um, and I find it hard then to like to keep it in mind that they are the same person mm -hmm. because the way that they approached things were so different. But then I find the the conversation that that's bringing up about like how our younger selves treat our bodies mm -hmm. without any regard for what that's going to do to us in the future is a very interesting commentary and it's something that I think the film does handle really well. Um, but yeah, I, I struggled a wee bit with the Sue stuff. Um, I think partially also because that's when the the misogyny is like at its most blatant. Yeah, so, and we should say, I mean, th th this film does have... I'm going to say, I'm going to, in my typical Jim McLean rambly way, it is looking through the film with the male gaze but it's a, a female director and I'm going to get her name wrong it's Caroline Far Carly Fargo Fargo I think who did Revenge which I think is still on Shutter. it is which is just an absolutely fantastic film which if you've never seen I would recommend seeking out another film that kind of looks at the kind of revenge thriller tropes and cliches looks at it through the sleazy male gaze but it's directed by a woman. And I, I think there's interesting things because there's parts with the stuff of Sue when I'm like going, fuck, am I watching the old kind of push me? And then <laughs> whatever that dance song was, like, is that what I'm watching? The kind of sleazy when we have Dennis Quaid and just great as this sleazy movie producer, a sleazy TV show producer who's it like... It's called Harvey. Yes. <laughs> Just in we'll case not, you didn't get that. We'll not pull on that thread too much. And he looks exactly like Vince McMahon. Yes, <laughs> he does look very like months like Vince McMahon. But this idea is like, right, to me, you're too old. You're past it. We need to get a younger, sexier person in. Of course, to me, then on her birthday, is it her 50th birthday? Yeah. Mm -hmm. On her 50th birthday, she has this accident. Uh, good old Kerry Nurse suggests, have you seen The Substance? And I mean, I love the trailer. I love the mm -hmm. voice of yeah. the other end of like, do you want to be a younger, better version of yourself? 
the substance is the cure. So basically the premise is we have the younger, I'm saying Qua- Quealy? Uh, that, that's just how I pronounce Margaret. it. I'm not sure if it is, which way is actually correct. Margaret. Annie McDowell's kid. <laughs> uh, that one. Margaret, who, I mean, I'm trying to think the last thing I would have seen her in would probably have been um, the Quentin Tarantino. She's Ooh, in, yeah, in... she's in Drive Away Dolls. It came out earlier this year. Oh, I hear that um, film. Did you see Kinds of Kindness? Oh, yeah. Yes. She had her boobies out in that. She did. She has she's... her boobies out a lot in this. More they're, they're, they're not her boobies, actually. Are they not? They're prosthetics. All right, well, they're boobies. Boobies are boobies. <laughs> you take, when you get to my age, you, when you get a glimpse, you, you have a wee look. That's all right, they weren't Demi's boobies either. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm not, no, maybe was Margaret Qualley in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? She yeah. was. She, yeah, yeah, she's the one in the car with the feet. With the yes. Old, yeah, and they, they, you know, how many films have we seen with Quentin and his feet? Yeah, I was right. I had a moment of self doubt for a second. I was like, yeah, okay, I'm okay. So, yeah, so seven days sh- she exists. The seven days Demi Moore exists. Demi, apologies, uh. Nicole, exists. And the younger self is arrogant, wants more time, doesn't feel like she's enough. So she starts to exist longer than she should. And the effects is then held on Demi Moore's character. I, I think there's lots, I mean, as I mentioned, Brian Usner. By the time this film reaches its finale, it's like, right, okay, this is just society. Yeah. This is just society. And I think there is a couple of shots. It's almost like shot for shot where it looks very much like, yeah, you've been influenced by that. I'm waiting for someone to go... What is it? He says, like, you're a real butthead mm-hmm. <laughs> in society and all that kind of reanimator kind of that wonderful, gloopy, physical. I know there's CGI in it, but there's just something wonderful, we- wonderfully weird about the film. But I don't know about me. A lot of people I know have seen the film and say, oh, it's disgusting. There's, there's, there's a bit with teeth and a bit with ears <laughs> and fingernails. It's like, it was too much for me. And I was like, I watched it's like, really? I mean, I, I said, because I know in the next part we're going to be talking about the Terrifier movies. Gore doesn't scare me. It can get, it can creep me out and, you know, ick me out at times, but it doesn't scare me. And I sat and watched it going, like, I've seen worse than this. I've seen worse than this in the 80s. You know, I'm I'm not child. But either of you really that icked out by it? I wasn't, I, like the Terrifier movies make me laugh because yeah. it's so over the top. Um, and like you say, this is sort of the opening credits of society where it kind of pans over that you don't really know what it is. Mm. It's sort of similar to the big reveal of... I'll be honest, you just talk about the opening of the film. I actually thought for a second, it's like, has this been produced by, is it Dirty Sanchez? Or the uh, Will Ferrell production company? Oh, the Cause coffee oh, cup? Yeah. Gary Sanchez? Because yeah. they have the coffee and then they have the two eggs. Yeah. And at the start, it's like going, is this produced by Will Ferrell's company? Like, oh, no, that's actually a part of the film. Sorry, okay, I'm back in the room. Back. Sorry. Uh, I, I shouted over you for a, a pointless joke. Apologies. I'll make a joke as well. Yeah. Uh, I always compare my girlfriend to an egg because she looks like an egg. And when um, there was the egg on the screen, I <laughs> no, just throw one at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the gore, though, uh, I think I talked about a TV show. Like, whenever the blood stops spraying mm. um, over everybody, there was a guy behind me who went, like, fuck, that's over. Because <laughs> he couldn't take it. But I, like, at that point, I know James Oliver talked on the TV show the last 30 minutes he didn't enjoy. The last 30 minutes, like yourself, Nicole, I was fucking pissing myself yeah. laughing because yeah. of how over the top it is. Um, and I think that's really just the point. Like I said on the telly show last week, it's like these women gave the producers the, their themselves completely over and give their all. And this and is... It's still not enough. It's still not enough. Yeah. And this is literally the physical manifestation of that. Um, and, you know, uh, people, like you say, people say it is gory, but it's not actually. No. I, I think it's more terrifying when, like, Demi... Mirror is uh, to me is um, sort of like to me to me the hunchback and not your doll yeah. <laughs> sort of running through the streets. I think that's uh, scary. She's doing her like we quick step. Oh, like, it's so funny! <laughs> and then when she fucking boots Margaret into the into the poster, it's great. Yeah, yeah, I I had a blast with this film. I'm gutted I didn't get to see it on the cinema because I know it's going to be on Mubi soon. Mm. Uh, I'm gutted I didn't get to see it in the big... There's still time. I might try to seek it out and try to see it in the big screen because I, I love a film where it's a new voice in horror 
And yes, you can see like in the clay the, the reference points that you can see. But on like we're Todd Phillips, it's like, right, here's an odd, here's an odd. There's a reference. Movie scholars, people into their, their art house cinema will love. Here you have a film. I'm not being artsy farsy about it, but here's someone who's like, okay, there's the reference, but I'm trying to do my own thing. Hmm. Or it's, I'm using that to do, to tell my story. And you can see where I've been influenced. I think there's a big difference. Yeah, 100%. And it's the fact that Todd Phillips is not a good director. Yeah. Here we have the director of The Substance is clearly a talented director. Anyone who's seen Revenge would know that as well. It is funny that, like, with Revenge and this, it is very much 80s aesthetic. Yeah. Like, this would easily be made in the 80s, but modernised. And Todd Phillips has made a, a modern movie, but tried to go back to an 80s yeah. aesthetic. But I think it's interesting. If you made those films in the 80s, they'd be made by a man. Yeah. And they'd probably look 90% the same. Made by a man, but written by a woman. Yeah. That's the way the 80s was. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's I actually, true. something that it reminded me of at certain points was... Slumber Party Massacre. Mm. Oh, Jim, a movie we missed out on showing this year. I Next know. year. I know. Oh, it's so good. But like specifically the the bit in Slumber Party Massacre where they're in the showers and it's panning over. And like that's a female director mm -hmm. who was told you have to have a certain amount of tits and ass mm -hmm. in this film. So she was like, okay, I will give you that and nothing else in this while I'm panning over this. And it's like forcing you to look at it to the point mm. where it's borderline uncomfortable yeah even if you're getting turned on by it or whatever like it's still like okay there's nothing else that i can hide like the titillation with here mm. it's literally just tits and ass yeah. and that's kind of what the um the, like pump it up all that sort yeah. of thing reminded me of have you ever um, seen the music video for the nick cave song bring it on no they um they brought out this song and they were like, if you want your music video to play on MTV, then I mean, you're going to have to modernize this. So the music video is Nick Cave, mm -hmm. a man in his 60s, mm -hmm. with the rest of his band, who are also in their 60s, surrounded by uh, 20-year-old uh, black bootylicious women all oiled up <laughs> while our souls just clap <laughs> towards the, the screen. It's a music video that doesn't get talked about anymore because maybe mm. it's a wee bit you know, yeah. too much on the nose. It's always on repeat in the Neeson household. <laughs> <All right. laughs> but um, while watching this, I was like, I see what you're going for. Yeah, yeah. the film, it kind of reminded me of, apart from all the brand news and the kind of body horrors I've mentioned, ad nauseum. Um, either you've seen Starry Eyes? Yes. yes. Yeah, 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 that kind of... In the sense of kind of the pressures women find themselves under in the pursuit of fame and how it, as Adam alluded to, it takes everything from them and pretty much gives them fuck all back. Mm. It takes them up and chews them. And there's, like, there's a line near the end of this film, it's like um, uh, Quaid's characters, they're sitting in the audience getting ready for the New Year's Eve party. It's like... I made her. This is my creation. It's like Frankenstein, mm. almost in the sense. And then literally it is almost, I guess, Frankenstein's monster who reveals himself, who reveals herself, sorry, other than the fact she has a little Demi Moore mask. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to hide everything. And a wee booby pops out. <laughs> yeah. We've all been there. Shout out to the older gentleman that play the entourage around uh, uh, fucking Dennis Quaid. Mm. Um who you all go <laughs> as they <laughs> chuckle while leaving. I think they're great. Yeah. Uh, so, great film, I think. Very enthusiastic. Anything else you want to say before we move on? And can maybe, I don't know of any other movies you want to talk about in this week's Ramble. Oh, not this week. Anything else you want to talk about in this month's Ramble before we move on? I'm sure there's a few other you know, TV movies we've watched. But anything else you want to mention about The Substance? Uh, it, not to be, you know, a sleazy old man, but watching our Margaret, I was going, Jesus Christ, bye. See, I was the person in the audience who was like, why does Demi Moore not love herself more? Because she looks amazing. Mm. And not that Margaret Crowley doesn't look amazing. Mm. But as you've probably figured out at this point, my type is a, is approximately 60 years old. Yeah. Um, Have any hot 60-year-old women <laughs> listening? Lorraine. Anything you want to say to them right now, Nicole? Only if they're Sharon Stone. Yeah. <laughs> also, I've thought of a, you know, this is the second movie we've talked about with Demi I thought of a, a, a section that you could come on, Nicole, and we'll call them. You know, because we like to have like wee subtitles yeah. for like things. We'll call it Mur Mur Mur. <laughs> How do you like it? Where we just watch Demi Mur movies. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Hundred percent. 
We're watching strip tease again, guys. Yes. <laughs> G. You're G. the only one out of the three of us that doesn't like it. So. Maybe, maybe G. G. second time. G. I. G. in next time. Here, G. I. G. is not bad. Yeah. G. I. G. is fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. love Demi Moore. I do. I think she's she's fab. And it's great to see her back because I hadn't seen her. No, she kind of, she took a bit of a break in the 90s. Mm. And then came back with Charlie's Angels full yes. throttle because what else would you come back mm. with? But then and she's I, brought her dog on the, oh, on the press. Oh, Pilaf. I love Pilaf so much. She's brought her little dog on the press um, tour for the substance. She probably had to, you know, rid herself of um, maybe some sexual trafficker that she was mm. married to. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah. not pull on that thread. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Hollywood hasn't been kind to her in the last 20 years. No. I feel like, which I feel like is this film is like the culmination of that. Yeah. yeah. But she's come back in such a big way. Because I, I have to say, not moves, but I thought like... There's all this stuff to start we've mentioned with the egg uh, and kind of the giving you basically showing you what the substance does. But then there's also that little sequence and it's called back at the very end of the film about the star. And I thought yeah. it's like, well, that was quite mm. kind of, uh, and not up in the sense with, with Demi Moore, but that sense of young up and coming actor gets their star fame and you see it literally being kind of, Boked. There's, I think there's someone's sick on it, and someone drops a burger. Yeah. yeah, all that kind of stuff. And then by the end of the film, it's cracked and it's broken. It's imperfect, but it's still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a fab film. And the film I've heard, I've only heard good things about as as a companion piece for a double bill is a different man. Yeah, which I'm busting to see. Maybe by the next ramble, we will have seen. So this is the point where we throw it open to yourselves Nicole, Adam anything else you want to talk about that you've seen over the last month you really want to get off your chest and wax lyrical about I watched um, Oddity mm, I'm busting to see it's him. really good I really really liked it I um, hated it no oh. <laughs> what, did, what did you think of Caveat though I didn't I didn't like Caveat at all okay yeah no, fair enough because I did I I think Damien McCarthy's brand of mm. creepy and Slightly kitschy, sometimes horror is is really for me. I don't know why. I just thought that some of, the, not some, all of the male actors in the movie are terrible. That's fair enough, actually. Yeah. The lady um, that plays the main character, she does a double part, yeah, yeah. sort of thing. I thought she was great. Really liked her. Um, but like the, the male actors, just badly written. They mm. all, there's no nuance to. Like the main guy. No, there's not at all. He's just a prick from beginning to end. And, and he gets like, progressively worse. Yeah. Um, but when he, not to spoil anything, but when he's trying to lead her over to somewhere to put yeah. her into danger, you're like... I was just like, you absolute bastard. Yeah, he's like fucking Wiley Cody sort of yeah. antics. He sucks. I'm looking forward to watching. I've heard because Brian Philip Davis is the editor. He's a friend of the show. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're hoping to send the X in the Rob to Halloween if we can get an interview with the director. Because, um, Kevin, I've seen, I'm a fan of, I just haven't got a chance to see it already. I haven't been to the cinema. Do you for... like the bunny in Caveat? Mm. Can anyone like the bunny? I love the bunny. He turns up. <laughs> I think he's great. I got such a kick out of that. I was like... I was. Just, I heard the, the wee symbols and mm. I was like, oh, is it the bunny? And then it's the bunny. Yeah. It's Love good. For, I haven't seen it for a while, but yeah, I'm hoping they hopefully we'll try and see if we can get it already. But that's one Irish horror. Another that's just hitting streaming services is Haunted Ulster Live. I know on the TV show we had a shorter version of that interview. I think we will play our little chat with Dominic O'Neill, the film's writer and director. And before you hear that chat, uh, let's play a little clip of the trailer. We now have a very special live broadcast for Halloween. Spooky goings on in a Belfast home. This is Haunted Ulster Live. Viewer discretion is advised. They've set up all sorts of impressive cameras, microphones and sensors around the house. Stephen had to come in to me a couple of times. He was that scared. He needs me to guide him to the spirit world where he can find peace. (laughs) It's unmistakable. The truth for the life. No one shall come to the Father except through me. There stands a whore of Satan! The stop this. You are not going to want to avert your eyes for even a second. So that's a clip of Haunted Ulster Live, and I'm joined now by the film's writer and director, Dominic O'Neill. Dominic, uh, pleasure to have you on the show. So take me back to Halloween 1998. Tell us as much as you want our viewers and our listeners to know about Haunted Ulster Live going in. So thanks for having me on, Jim. Uh, Haunted Ulster Live is a live broadcast 
from a, uh, uh, a haunted house in Belfast, well, a house where a family believes there's some poltergeist activity. And uh, it is not UTV, they're TVNI, but if you, if, you, if you kind of squint at the logo, it might look a bit like UTV. Um, and they're investigating the house. So it's very much a kind of like a regional TV broadcast live from the house. Our two presenters are Jerry Burns, who's a sort of TV veteran, and Michelle Kelly, who's a kind of up and coming children's TV presenter. And during the broadcast, they do all the sorts of normal things that you do on a ghost hunting TV show. They bring in paranormal investigators. They talk to the neighbors, try to suss out the history of the house and what's been going on. And I suppose at the midpoint of the film, things go in a different direction. And we see behind the scenes. So it's a, it's a, they go to commercial breaks and the camera stays in the house. So we get to see a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes. And the broadcast, I suppose, starts to fall apart a little bit and goes in unexpected places. I think I think that's put it nicely that it's going wrong um, in certain ways. Um, one of the questions that came to mind when I was watching the film, and there there is a TV movie, if you want to call it, a TV broadcast, infamous broadcast from the BBC. We're going to see how far we can get into this interview without either, particularly me, um, bringing it up, right? Because I am I'm a man in my 40s, and that had a vivid, that left a vivid memory for me. So we're going, but we're going to get as far as we can get without those comparisons, without talking about that being an influence. But you talk about there, the fact that we see behind the scenes in the broadcast. Was there any point where you kind of talked about, and maybe this is down to budgeting issues, but because we do see a few, without going into spoilers, near the end of the film, of of adverts and i guess they are very northern irish specific um you know you you almost feel like you want to hum the cats in the cradle for particularly through one but was there any point where you thought about kind of doing this as kind of like a a recording of a vhs and and we would have ads from the time or was it always going to be a case you wanted to see behind the scenes as the madness just slowly descended into anarchy it was it was definitely the the former. It was seeing behind the camera, um, see what goes seeing what was going on behind the scenes. That was a way to give the characters more of a life rather than just seeing their broadcast personalities. And that kind of you know when the when the camera cuts and the mask drops or the mask slips and you kind of get to see a little bit of realism. I I I just thought that was fun um, and it helped us tell their story. Um, you're right about the TV ads. I suppose in a perfect world, you would love to like pull out real ad- adverts from the time, but of course for licensing, I can't even imagine how, how you would uh, approach that and if it would even be possible. Um, but I, th- I suppose I, I, I know the comparison you're making and I also <laughs> always love to remember watching it. Um, I remember it quite vividly. I, I remember that I knew that it was fictional um, I know a lot of people thought it was real. I, I knew it was fictional, but it still scared scared me. I was 12. Uh, and it was also the first night I saw Halloween. So <laughs> that also... That's a, that that's a double crazy. bill. That's a double bill. And clearly you were much more astute than me. Um, I was a little bit younger. I was a little bit younger mm-hmm. in my defence. I was 10. Well, probably about that time, but nine so um yes uh, and for anyone who's not in on this we're, we are talking about ghost watch there we go dominic i've i set myself this challenge i wasn't going to mention it but there we go how many minutes oh. were into the interview um i anyone who knows me knows i absolutely adore ghost watch it's one of those things that kind of if you want to call it a high i've always been chasing ever since that that memory of being absolutely terrified yeah it holds up really really well um, I had to not watch it for a few years because you worry about two specific little things seeping into your brain. But funnily enough, the primary um, influence for this was in about 2009, there was a, a BBC um, ghost hunting show called Northern Ireland's Greatest Haunts, which uh, you will not find on the iPlayer, but you will find on YouTube. Um, uh, but it was a lot of like the, the the kind the kind of mediums and paranormal investigators that you would see on um, most haunted shows like that. But they were investigating um, places in 
Belfast, well, Northern Ireland, and they would never find anything. And it was excruciating. And I loved it. And I loved the culture of these shows and how their obsession with like digital photographs and little bits of dust, which of course were orbs, and how they would try to like make something out of nothing. And I loved just thinking about how the investigators like went home and had normal lives and probably had other jobs. And just I love that side of it, that mm. the culture of ghost hunting really intrigues me. So that was and that was actually kind of the primary influence, because when I watched that show, I remember thinking there's a film here or there's a TV show here. But then, of course, as I started working up the story, you can't run away from ghost watch comparisons. But what we always wanted to do was we always wanted to make sure that we had our own story to tell. Yeah. Um, and that's hopefully when most people see it, I think they kind of they're happy that it sort of it sets itself apart. One of the things I loved about this in the sense that there early on it's unavoidable to get those comparisons and you kind of worry. It's like, is this going to be just Ghost Watch NI? But as you say, it it goes and does its own thing and there is that without spoiling because we won't I mean, people see the film but there's definitely elements of your short Bel uh, Belfast 1912 in there that's as much as I'm going to say about uh, about the film in the sense that there's elements in the DNA they share similar DNA in that front but specifically talking about Haunted Ulster Live talk us through filming um, challenges assembling your cast it's a low budget. There's, we always say that it's guerrilla filmmaking at its finest. Uh, you rely on a lot of goodwill from people. As uh, I always forget, who says the quote? It's a miracle any movie gets made. So tell yeah. me, Dominic, how did this movie get made? Well, this I started properly writing the script um, uh, March 2020. I don't know if you remember March 2020, but something else significant happened. So I'll, I think a lot of screenwriters and filmmakers started new projects in march 2020 and we and then two years of working on the script with my producer will mcconnell um talking to actors um talking to you know like possible distributors and festivals and taking it to marketplaces we finally worked up a project that we thought was cheap enough that we could do ourselves in a small period of time we got on some um, amazing cast and crew it helped that lockdown was on and off because a lot of cast and crew didn't have big long jobs on so they could sacrifice a week to work for much less than they would normally get um which was kind of how we made it we made it in six days if we had been shooting it in three weeks we would never have got the cast and crew that we got because take asking people to take three weeks off um would have been feasible for them we got the most amazing house. I'm sure you'll agree the house is great. Um, we didn't have to do loads to it. Um, we knew that we had the house if we needed it for a period of two months. Um, and it was over Halloween two years ago. And that was like, this is it. Like, we're never going to get this location. Detached, correct period, 19, kind of or for like 1900s on the corner of a street with a nice hedge where you can do interviews outside. Like it just, it was just perfect. So everything just kind of came together. We had about two months of pre-production, got on board a brilliant production designer, Alexander Moore, um, great DP, Connor Losty, just fantastic people who were between, between projects. Tim Lyons, unbelievable first AD, who didn't bat an eyelid when I told him we wanted to shoot the film six days. Um, and it just all came together. And that's not even mentioning the cast, who I'm sure you'll agree are like the highlight because the cast sell it, you know, they really and I, I was I made sure everybody knew this this is funny, but it isn't really a comedy. Like there's well, it's not a parody. We're kind of like it's a little bit of a love letter to like that kind of TV, but there's no winking at the camera. Everybody plays it pretty much straight. Um and that's something that I'm very happy with because I think that's what kind of sells the realism of the broadcast a little bit before things go crazy. Um, like 90s TV did look <laughs> like that. Hopefully we got it pretty close, but also just the way people acted, you know. Another good thing is when you're doing interviews, 
with like um, Fox Pops in a film like that, it's okay if people look at the camera. It's okay if people are a wee bit nervous because yeah. they're supposed to be, they're like their neighbors who have just come out to sort of have a look. You know, when people, not everybody was used to being on camera 25 years ago. These days, like we have, everybody has a video camera in their pocket. So there's little bits, little bits and pieces like that made it all um, achievable. I would say we just got, oh, we got lucky with a lot of, a lot of great um, cast and crew involved. I just want to come back and touch on that. You mentioned this was filmed in six days. Now, there's people watching this, people listening to this, might think that's not a hard thing to do, but that is a really tight thing to do. You mentioned there, I think I heard you say, was it two months of, of pre-production? How yeah. important was that in being able to then come in, I guess, storyboard prep and having that tight turnaround for six days to, to get this done and dusted? Yeah, your 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 pre production is 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 really so that on day one from the start everybody knows exactly what they're doing. They've rehearsed. Of course, that doesn't happen, but that's the idea. Um, we were we had two days rehearsal with the actors. One of those days was in the house. That was crucial, um, and one of those was with the camera because the camera runs about, um, follows the actors, um, live as as live TV does. Um, so a lot of that prep. One of the reasons you can shoot a film that quickly when it's found footage is because it it's just single camera setup. So most pe- most films, as people know, um, you'll shoot a scene maybe three or four different ways. So that's three or four times where the actors are doing everything, and it takes a long time to change lights, camera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you're cutting all of that out, which helps. Don't get me wrong; it's still tough. <laughs> I mean. Um, it helped that it was um, November because it was supposed to be Halloween night, so we we didn't have loads of daylight, so we could do long exterior shoots. Um, and the actors and the crew were just so professional and on it that made it possible, you know. Now, am I right? This is your first feature because I mean I know both with Banderflix and then I I know with our festival that we run because we screened. Belfast 1912 uh, if I'm correct it was an award winning short at our award festival winner, yeah. so this was your first feature what did you learn from that short that then you brought to the feature I think uh, film is collaboration um, get people that you know can, you can work with and have great ideas listen to their ideas um, when you have to make a decision make, the director makes the decision but um Collaborate, definitely. Uh, and let actors act, let them do their thing, you know. Um, cast people that you've seen who you know are great and bring them in on that basis. Um, very much that, really. And one of the reasons you can do that in Belfast is because we have such a wealth of talent here. Like, as you know, like we really, really do. Um, it's incredible. So just draw from that well and sort of be humble and listen. Listen to people who are experienced professionals. It's had a pretty successful festival run. I know Fright Fest, Belfast Film Festival, further afield. Um, talk us through, I mean, what have been the highlights for you? Fright Fest surely must be up there to have it screened. Um, just a, a great horror festival in London. Uh, what's been the festival's journey like as now we you prepare for the next stage as it goes out to to vod release yeah uh it's been about a year really uh you're right fry fest incredible um any i mean for anybody to have their film screened in, in leicester square is obviously like a career highlight the other thing about fry fest is it's got such a name in the horror world that as soon as you get into fry fest your film's got a little bit of weight behind it you start getting emails from people you get interested parties which is invaluable um, Halloween night Belfast Film Festival last year to a packed screen one in the QFT was definitely a highlight. I think the other things are when your film plays in theatres all over the world, like in San Francisco or Mexico or Brazil, just of festivals that you can't necessarily go to, but you get such a buzz knowing that mm. all over the world are seeing it. and you got to wonder what they make of it. Because <laughs> that's one question I want to ask. I mean, I suppose particularly it's easier with the likes of Fright Fest when you're there, but Haunted Ulster Live, it's a very authentic slice 
of, of, of Northern Ireland, but it's universal. I guess I come back to that point I made about the adverts earlier on. It's that sense that maybe doing that with the adverts would make it too specific to here and getting behind the scenes allows that universal, universality. But uh, what's been kind of the reception? Because it is, it is an authentic slice of, of, of NI culture, if you want to call it that, but it's universal. I, I think being specific is always the way to go. And they say that's kind of one of, there's a line in Inside Number Nine where Reese Shearsmith says that, you know, the thing about comedy is you've got to be specific. You don't say biscuit, you say Garibaldi. And I think horror is very similar. Uh, you look how specific Dairy Girls is. People like Dairy Girls because they probably don't get all you know internationally they might not get all of the humor they may not even understand all the language but they know they're getting something authentic i think that's the way to go people are also curious about northern ireland they're curious about the troubles there's you know we are in a lot of media at the minute there's a lot going on um so i i think it's i don't think anybody should shy away from that and obviously they always say right what you know so like I know 90s Belfast, <laughs> you know, so you, you draw from that well, you know. Yeah, without a doubt. And as I say, before I let you go now, the film will be available on VOD platforms from the 14th of October. How exciting is that? Now, that's the next stage of your film's journey. You've you've pre-production, you've filmed it, you've took it on the festival circuit, and now it's there. Anyone watching, listening to this can, can seek it out and watch it at home, maybe even on Halloween night if they're brave enough. Yeah, absolutely. 14th of October. Uh, it's brilliant. Knowing that it's out in the world, knowing that I can stop banging on about it and people can just actually watch it uh, is great. And then it's out of our hands. It's, it's, in the public, it's in the public domain and I'm excited to see what people make of it. Brilliant. Dominic, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And as we say, Haunted Ulster Live is available on VOD platforms from the 14th of October. Thank you very much, Dominic. Cheers, Jim. Thank you. People say, if there were black footprints beside your bed, it means he'd been there. We need the police! Or bring the army in! The man was found in Montgomery Street in Belfast city centre. The scene is still cordoned off. Guys, we talked about this in the TV show. I think we were all really upbeat and enthusiastic about this because I was worried when I heard about this film last year. Uh, so Dominic, I have not worked with, but past alliances with the Dark Hedges International Film Festival, his short Belfast 1912, if I'm getting that right, won not our inaugural, but I think the first year of the film, fe- the fully fledged film festival, his short won, I think it was either audience choice or director's choice. I believe it was audience. Audience. You you know more research on these things than I do. Because I was one of the judges. Yes. <laughs> we shouldn't reveal that. But that was when you weren't an official Banterflix yes. contributor involved. You were just a local, talented local filmmaker. I think you'd won. I'd won the Christmas. Yes. And that was why we then brought you back. So that was then in some... And I think there's elements of Belfast 1912 within Haunted Ulster Life mm-hmm. in terms of what it does with the haunted house motif and the supernatural going on will not spoil. I know we've spoiled Joker Folly Adieu, but I was very nervous about Haunted Ulster Live because when something evokes the spirit of Mr. Pipes and Ghost Watch, I'm always very cautious because I adore Ghost Watch. We screened it last year at the festival. Had a ball. Yes, there's elements of the film that have dated and maybe don't work as well in, on a big screen as they do at home when you're watching it, particularly when you're an eight-year-old watching it getting scared shitless on Halloween night. I'm always nervous when something evokes that. And I know we talked about I think I made it mention in the TV show. It was a bit like why I was left a bit underwhelmed or disappointed by Late Night with the Devil mm-hmm. because there was a film, maybe not in its marketing, but I know the London Film Festival last year, they leaned heavily and like this is Ghost Watch and it got it with heavy nods to Ghost Watch. And I think if I remember, Adam, you were a big fan of Late Night with the Devil? Yes, but in retrospect, I would say that it's not really Ghost Watch at all. Yeah. It's weird. 
I know, I know, but it's that sense of a, something supernatural happening on screen. Yeah. And I guess this film, Late Night with the Devil, has a lot of similarities with Haunted Ulster Live in the sense that you get to, to see behind the camera when they're going for adverts and things like that. Mm. You don't cut to the adverts. You you see, like, everyone's talking, everything's, oh, it's all going great on screen, but as soon as it cuts to the camera, it's like, well, this is a fucking shit show. This is going horribly wrong. And interestingly enough, Haunted Ulster Live does it more in a more smooth nature. Yeah, without a doubt. Mm. I... I think, for me, my problem with the Late Night with the Devil was that it goes too far. Mm. And it's like, right, once you go there with all the kind of stuff, nastiness on screen and weird bits where I left go, how do you get that footage? How does that work? If that's a dream sequence and if it's a found footage or you're looking, meant to be looking from the tapes, you don't have any of that here. Yeah. Haunted Ulster Live, it knows what it's working with. Very start at the opening there's a lot of heavy nods to Ghost Watch in that same setup. So there's inside the house, there's people gathering outside the house, there's there's crowds gathering, there's interviews with people, and you're like, oh, you can't say fuck live on radio, on, <laughs> live on TV. There is a, a radio DJ, but I, I don't know how much we want to go into that. But there is a radio, so there's allegedly a radio DJ up in the the attic while this is all going on, and then everything else is is going on, and then as the film goes on it becomes apparent that it's not just redoing ghost watch there's not an aforementioned mr pipes but with a northern irish accent mm. there's something else going on and if you've seen belfast 1912 you'll kind of know what i'm talking about in that sense timey wimey is as much as i'm going to say Twin Peaks: The Return. I, I yes, remember. you said that on the tv show so i i was i have to say after being nervous at the start, once I finally said, well, you're doing your own thing, I really enjoyed this. Mm-hmm. And it's a sense of low-budget filmmaking that's been refined and refined and refined. You've got a, a smart script. You have a filmmaker that knows the limitations of his budget, of what he can and can't do. And as we've mentioned, the fact that you cut, when it cuts to adverts, we don't see the adverts anymore. We're seeing behind the, the, behind the curtain of, of sorts off this is really a shit show and it's going horribly wrong but people are there because their careers one's careers on the wane one's potentially on the rise very very smart film i i genuinely pleasantly surprised by and i i and i don't mean that in a downbeat way i didn't expect to like enjoy this and love this film as much as i did mm-hmm. but i did nicole adam what do you think of haunted ulster life pretty much the exact same as you yeah um i said on the tv show as well i was a wee bit apprehensive because of the Ghost Watch comparisons, just because Ghost Watch is so good, mm. and I actually only watched it for the first time maybe, maybe three or four years ago, and then watched it last Halloween with my friend, and just had such a good time with it, and it's it's almost impossible to recapture what Ghost Watch yeah. does, um, and this film probably quite smartly like starts out. Maybe, maybe giving you low expectations because mm. you think it's just trying to do that again. That, but and a pish take of it. Well, not a pish take, but a parody where it's, it's, it is playing for laughs. Yeah, like it is genuinely funny, mm. so funny. And I'm not gonna lie, they're the wee whenever uh, they're like out interviewing the neighbours, and the wee man talks about the finians down the road. Yeah. I was just like, oh my god, um, and it just it was something so stupid. Yeah. And funny and so specific to hear that I just, it caught me so off guard that it just really made me laugh out loud at how ridiculous it was. Or other people um, that are being there going, so do you, do you know anything about what's going on in the house? Nah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> just just hear the TV crews here, just having a wee look. Or the the woman who was just like, I always knew there was something funny about that house. Yeah. It's just like, it's just silly things that are just like, it's, I mean, stuff like that's not even like specific to Northern mm-hmm. Ireland, but it just is. I know that person, yeah, and it just makes it really entertaining and relatable, and like cozy yeah. to watch almost. Like I do think this would be a really good Halloween watch yeah. with like maybe not. I don't think my family would enjoy it because they're not horror people. But I just I can see you watching it with your parents or something, and just everybody getting something out mm. of it. 
because of the the nature of it and and the, the like time period that it's set in and everything and just yeah 98 mm. tvni which mm. is no way in any way similar similar to utv no <laughs> no not at all no it's um it's funny Dominic the director I, if I was him I would have been so annoyed watching Late Night with the Devil because they were produced sort of at the same time you know they obviously hadn't seen each other but the parallel thinking and the, the parallel storytelling mm-hmm. that happens in that movie that also happens in this movie I was like oh like there's a, a character passes away off screen in the exact same manner that they mm-hmm. pass away in Late Night with the Devil and if I was Dominic I'd be like bastards <laughs> because we did it first um this is really fun. I actually can't stop thinking about it since I watched it. Mm-hmm. You know, I was thinking back at some moments that I actually really enjoyed. And with stuff like um, Ghost Watch and Late Night with the Devil and the WNUF Halloween special, those three movies are quite similar to this, apart from the ending. Those three movies all end with a bombastic, mm. the, everything's gone to shit, the world's going to shit. We have captured it on camera. Michael Parkinson. <laughs> you know, whereas this kind of takes a clever turn on it. Yeah. Um, and it's not the not to be like, oh, guys, the fucking you know the end of this is is mind blowing. It's just nice to have an ending that instead of your mind going, oh, well, something's going to happen and something's going to jump out and the camera's going to fucking turn off and be mm. like, well, that's what happened on the night of 1998, <laughs> isn't that well? To have something that, by the third act, makes you lean in a little bit forward more to be like, oh, fuck, something something is going on here. And um, to have that is very, very smart. And Dominic does a great job directing. Um, I was listening to his interview um, talking to Gav from Fright Club mm-hmm. and, you know, talking that, like, they don't, really improvise that much everything was written even yeah. like the wee smaller moments and with the characters the bit that makes me laugh the most is when um jerry talks about his stalker and then the callback to that later yeah. on makes me fucking laugh so much because you could you could imagine someone like jerry anderson having that mm. conversation behind the scenes um and it's just it's something that is something off its time weirdly i don't know if younger people would get this as much i think they would in a sense of like the horror of it all but i think we're all all of a similar age where we all remember like literally remember 1998 and like that sort of like television that night that it just hits us all at the right time but international viewers i think will get a real kick out of this because i think horror fans love seeing things from different places around the world and it's rare that you get to see fucking Northern Ireland on the big screen um, and something. But it's not Northern... It, it's Northern Irish, but it's not just Northern Irish. As, as I think I've said on the TV show... What's the TV show, kids? It's a love letter to Northern Irish TV, yes, but it's a love letter to, to local TV. And everywhere, no matter where you live in the world, whether it's the States, Australia... Yes, you'll have your big kind of global networks, like I guess like Sky and stuff here and Fox, etc. and all other channels. But you'll always have local channels. Like here in Belfast now, we have the likes of NVTV that that, that, that Bantflix is on as yeah. well, which is a local channel. It's low budget and there's passion in the people that are making it. I know in this sense there's a case of like people just, they just want to get the job done. As I say, some people, their careers are on the down. Others, their careers, are they are going to not get that job with Blue Peter? We'll have to wait and see. <laughs> but it's just, I think that's relatable. Because I know in the in the interview we mentioned, I talked with Dominic, Dominic about at any point were you interested or were you going to do it where it was a tape? What could you mention? Like, is it a, a tape that you're watching and I know ultimately it doesn't really work given what happens within the film, but I know there is moments where you see adverts. Yeah. And they are piss take adverts, but they are adverts that are pretty much true to what were around at the time. I feel, I think I said either in the, in the telly show and did the interview, I feel, felt the need to start singing The Cats in the Cradle <laughs> during one in particular. But I think had they went too much into that, I think it, it makes it too Northern Irish. I think they just get the balance... Right. I think the only thing they maybe needed, possibly, which I know traumatises everyone when they're not from Northern Ireland, is the don't drink and drive adverts. Yeah, I think 
Um, if you push it too much, like the, I can talk about the WNUF Halloween special. That uh, have you have you seen that? Mm-hmm. Have you seen that? Yeah. It's it's great, but it definitely pushes the whole fake commercial yeah. side of it too far, where it ends up feeling like an adult swim. Um, you know, like sort of advertisement, like fake advertisement sort of thing. Whereas, like I've just remembered you talking about the cats in the cradle. That yeah. ever, that advertisement absolutely could have been on Northern Irish TV. It's not an advertisement. There's a thin line you have to walk between both local humour and comedy as mm. as a thing. And those advertisements could have been the death of this. Yeah, uh, I think the fact that, that they only do, I think, two. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they play it straight down the barrel and it's uh, you get you local people get the humor um because they're like fuck i remember an ad just like that yeah. whereas if you did an ad where somebody got in the car and they're like what a bitch you'd be like i oh, guess <laughs> it's taking me out of this fucking film but it is very smart what they've done and um it works on a clever level rather than going for the whole the low-hanging fruit mm-hmm. yeah yeah i i'm really and I know it sounds really patronising when I say it, and in fact, I'm a host of a band of show, being we're small fries in the grand scheme of things. I was really pleasantly surprised by it, in the sense, not that I expected it to be poor or bad, because I'd seen Dominic short, and I mean, I was a big fan of Belfast 1912. I thought it was quite clever in what it was trying to do, and again, a well-executed short for what it's trying to do and works within its budget and its time frame. I just was a sense, my main concern, my main worry was that this was going to... And I know Dominic, kind of in an interview, he kind of said, like, Ghost Watch was only a small part of the influence behind this. Other shows, like, kind of the Ghost Hunter stuff mm. is has been a reference point as well. But the fact that it's... Yes, it wears the clothing at the start of Ghost Watch, but it, it, once it kind of takes that off and does its own thing, it's like, right, okay, I can just relax now, and I think it's genuinely clever. Yeah, it uses the shorthand of Ghost Watch. Yeah. Yeah. And use that. So yeah, so that's Haunted Ulster Live. That's available to rent or buy here. I think was one of you saying it's available on Screenbox? Screenbox mm-hmm. from the eighth in the United States of yes. America. So there you go. Wherever you're listening in the world, hopefully you can get it uh, and seek it out. Um I know we're gonna wrap up now. Anything else you wanna mention just before we go, kids? I watched Pretty Woman for the first time. <gasps> for the first time? What do you think? Great film. Yes, it is agreed. Richard Gear, what's up? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I watched Being John Malkovich <gasps> for the first time Ooh. last week. I didn't know what to expect. I I watched it because Catherine Keener is in it. That is genuinely... And there's a lot of Catherine Keener in it. There is mm-hmm. indeed. And she does some things that I didn't expect. Mm. As does everybody in that film, actually. I didn't know what it was actually about. Oh, really? Apart from John Malkovich. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so I Good old Charlie. Isn't just... that Charlie Kaufman mm-hmm. screenplay? Yeah. I didn't know that it was uh, him either. Mm. And I... Spike he... Jones. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the only Charlie Kaufman thing that I've seen, but the only thing that I can think of off the top of my head is I'm thinking of ending things. Eternal which Sunshine? I absolutely... Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I like that. Kung Fu Panda 2? Okay, he's gone up in my estimation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, did not did not know... I just thought it was about John Malkovich. Anomalisa? No isn't that the one? I don't really like uh, Anomalisa. Uh, adaptation? Yeah. Nick uh, Cage. It's good. So yeah, I felt like I was having a stroke. Mm. Is, there, is Kaufman Sincoti New York? Or is that someone else? Um, I think he is. Yeah, I can't remember the director though. I was I was on the Wikipedia William page Freakin. the other day. Let's say it's William Freakin. Well done, William Freakin. Should be William. <laughs> Good movie. Yeah. There's so, yeah. two films I haven't seen in a long time. I can't watch Pretty Woman with my mum because my mum will literally just... she's she's. I know I'm bad for some films. Mm. Just saying the line. Mm-hmm. My mum will literally just talk the whole way through, and she could lip sync it. Oh, really? And my mum loves Pretty Woman. the The sequence with the snails mm. is was it slippery little devils? Is it slippery little devils or is it slippery little fuckers? Slippery little devils. Devils. You know, yeah. Uh, the guy in it that plays like the uh, Major D. Major D that ends up being in the uh, Princess Diaries. Mm-hmm. Great stuff. And he's also in the American Dad Pistic of uh, Pretty Woman. Is he? Yeah. See, this is the thing about Pretty Woman. To you know the whole like, um, the like the literary Pretty Woman montage of like her trying on a grill. Just, I've watched Dumb and Dumber too much to not yeah. enjoy the Dumb and Dumber. Big version. mistake. <laughs> Big. Mi- Do you not think though, Pretty Woman, in the sense though, it's kind of like the ultimate male fantasy movie. 
Oh yeah, and mm-hmm. yeah, in the sense like right, I can a prostitute. She will fall in love with me, not just because I'm super wealthy. I didn't. But also, the like, I can save her. Yeah. Aspect of it, I think, is then she very saves him right male back. fantasy. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize there was going to be sex in it. Oh, I. I know mm-hmm. that there is about a prostitute, but like Richard Gere to me is like the least like sexless man. I know he's in fucking. Have you ever met a woman? Well, a straight woman. I should. <laughs> I know. I know that, but like, like of a certain age, they will all completely disagree with that. Of a certain, I think a straight woman of a certain age. But I, th- yeah. But I feel like, um, like Richard Gere in the Mothman prophecies, you're not going to be wanting the bang. <laughs> Maybe. I'm sure there's somebody. Yeah. somebody people want to buy Mothman, so the people yeah. definitely want to buy. Do they? Oh, the, oh my God! This is such a thing. Not for me personally, but really? I, I. Are you? Are you... He, he is Mothman. That where? What's appealing about Moth that? Mothman. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I no, I know some people that are really into Mothman. In, so in really Chicago. into Mothman. Really into. Him. Into Chicago, he's better of art. Oh, he is Mothman. Mm. Mothman. Mothman. So I just think of there's a there's a statue of Mothman somewhere. Mothman versus Mr. Cellophane. (laughs) Make it happen. (laughs) If we get our Netflix money for this year's Christmas (laughs) special, that's what will happen. Yeah, um, Richard Gere's a sexy man, but I didn't think an officer and a gentleman in space boots. I know, but is that American Gigolo? That's American Gigolo. But I didn't. Apart from American Gigolo. Yeah. Apart from American Gigolo, that's the only oh Jesus, that's the only um, movie Adam's erect. that I <laughs> looking at that photograph of Mothman that I was like, oh, he must have had sex in that movie. But you know, you ever watch like a, a like a, an actor and think they've never had sex in a film? Yeah, yeah. Do you know, but Richard Gere was one of those where I was like, people, really? women just look at him and go, isn't he gorgeous? Like, has Patrick Swayze he ever had sex in a movie? Yeah, of course, definitely. He has. Not in Dirty no. Dancing. Or did he just feel about I can't him? Dirty remember dirty. if he actually if there's if it's an actual sex scene or ghost. He makes love and ghost. Well, the, just a bit of the, like oh, you know, with um, it's them, not a full on sex. Them two from Soldier Soldier just singing in the background. Robinson and Jerome. Yeah, <laughs> that's a reference for the kids again. Yeah, well, like, Jim, how yeah. much do you love up on the roof? <laughs> <laughs> um, Soldier Soldier, I Robinson Jerome. Um, yeah, I'm pretty certain he does. I don't remember. What's uh, does he? Know? I'm pretty certain he has sex in Roadhouse. 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 Oh, Roadhouse, what a film. Don't watch. I don't think it's terrible. The the, um, the remix, not great, but it's not terrible. Oh, yes. I've I've actually heard quite bad things Jake about that. I've, I've seen it. The worst thing in it is Conor McGregor. Yeah. Once I've, he I've rocks up that, yeah. once he rocks up and his bare arse, you're like, oh, okay. oh, dear. He's playing the Joker that all of, of the people that love <laughs> the first Joker yes. want the Joker to be. Um. I was going to make a terrible joke about Donnie Darko, but we'll not go there. Oh, Patrick Darko. Swayze. We'll not go there. R.I.P. Oh, isn't he? Uh... He's a diddler. Yeah. <laughs> We've come full circle. Great movie, though. Yes. A movie I've appreciated more now. I remember watching you know, when you, you grow up and you're like, it's one of those people talk about, so you have to watch. Mm-hmm. I remember watching it being like, oh, fuck's that shit. See, I was that 13-year-old who was like, wow, this is so deep. Oh, really? <laughs> I was a 13-year-old that was like, do you ever, do you ever hear the Tim Minchin Donnie Darko song? <laughs> I was like, he's right. <laughs> I got sucked into a well. I have, very, I have very vivid memories. I didn't watch Donnie Darko when I was 13. I think I was probably just in first year at uni and watching it and just thinking it was like watching it really stupidly late at night because we used to go to RIP Extra Vision okay. on a Friday night uh, for those of us that weren't going back to Oma and we had it, we'd get a few beers in, pizza or whatever and just watch like three or four films back to back until like the the yield the hours and I remember like vividly watching Donnie Darko maybe it'd been about the, the third film between about two o'clock to about you know four, to be fair that's quite a good time to watch and Donnie Darko just been like what the fuck is this all in and loving it and then the next time I watched it was the director's cut which takes all the ambiguity oh. out of it it's like oh is this is good and then I find the original again it's like I like this and then I think are they, is they, are they talking about making a sequel to what was the terrible follow-up film? Uh, was it Richard Kelly? Yeah, Southland Tales. Yeah, Southland Tales, which I love. You love Southland Tales? I love Southland Tales because it's so weird and it's just got that whole sequence with them. Isn't it The Killers? The Killers and Justin Timberlake? Yeah, I yeah. got so, but I'm not a soldier. Yeah. It's I, just... You know what, mate? I also love Southland Tales. <laughs> there we go. I think they're talking about making a sequel to that. Don't. <laughs> because, I, I mean, he's kind of went off. He kind of did The Box, which I didn't like. 
the box, the box. And what's in the box? <laughs> what's in the box? What's in the box? Fuck up, Brad. Made that a joke a couple of weeks ago. Um, what's the Richard Kelly film that was just an absolute stinker? I thought he only did the three. I know I like Southland Tales. Was there Dwayne a... Johnson in Southland Tales? He is with the big scar on his face. Yeah. Um... Was there a movie called S Darko? There or? was indeed. Yeah. Yes, which is terrible. Which is it's, about it, his little sister. It's it's not terrible, terrible. It's just It's not good. No, it's not good. But I kind of it's like those shitty sequels that are straight to D V D I have appreciation for appreciation for, like Blair Witch Two, The Book of Shadows. Mm. And of course you love American Psycho too. Yes, which famously Who doesn't? which famously was not shot as American Psycho Two, was just retooled in post production. <laughs> Your brother Patrick, I. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are getting rambly. Um, I think we should go to some fancy shops in Belfast, Victoria Square, and see how long it takes for them to service. And then we come back weekly and go with the band of flicks, boys and girls. <laughs> you can serve us Big mistake I thought you were <laughs> suggesting We do a Bonterflex montage <laughs> <laughs> da, na, 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 na. <laughs> um, Isn't every episode <laughs> Bonterflex <laughs> montage So I think I've, I've enjoyed this Rambly chat I think it's been weirdly I say this at the run time I'm not quite sure How long we've been talking But um, It's been more coherent Than normal So yes Hopefully you have enjoyed This ramble edition Of the podcast as we say, we are into spooky season, so we were going to do a 99 special where we have our little films. I think at this point, you know, we're going to have this for November where we're going to look up. We should at this point reveal what the movies we will be talking about on our Bandaflix special. Bandaflix 99 special, the, the greatest year the cinema's ever known. So, at the last count, our votes, our vote winners were, unsurprisingly, says a lot about our listeners and fans on social media from 99 we'll we'll read the full selection of our movies so we had The Sixth Sense South Park Bigger Longer and Uncut Deep Blue Sea Wild Wild West American Beauty Summer of Sam Bringing Out the Dead Being Joel Malkovich uh, The Straight Story Sleepy Hollow Bowfinger and Magnolia so Nicole what are the films you think will have made the cut because I just watched it and I want to hear any kind of talk about it I'm going to go with being John Malkovich I'm kind of hoping Deep Blue Sea oh no I'm assuming Deep Blue Sea did not but I have a real soft spot for it you'd be wrong so, oh, really <laughs> Deep Blue Sea made the cut yeah oh that's exciting um, not for when I watched the last week and like, <laughs> oh it's not a good movie but Ew. I just have a soft spot for it yeah um, what else was there so we also had well, well I'll tell you the movies that made the cut so we've mentioned Deep Blue Sea. Mm-hmm. Unsurprisingly, since Adam won't fuck up about it and he gets to tell <laughs> his anecdote again, Wild Wild West yes. has made the cut. South Park, bigger, longer and uncut uh. made the cut. So I'm trying to think, is this so far we've had, because I think I picked Deep Blue Sea mm-hmm. and it yes. might have been the time I picked Deep Blue Sea because as we said on the previous poll we were talking about 99, there is other episodes of this podcast where this year we have talked about movies from 99. That's why they're not mm-hmm. on this list. And seek them out. So you've got the likes of uh, The Matrix. Minutes. You've got the likes of uh, The Mummy. Star Wars. Fright, Fight Club. Mm. All that kind of stuff. That's why they aren't that. So we've got Wild Wild West, Deep Blue Sea, South Park, Bigger, Longer, Uncut. And I am relieved by this. One, I feel, bona fide classic from 99 did make the cut. And that is Magnolia. Yeah. Which I love. It's a long movie. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to rewatching that. Um, I thought Bullfinger might have scraped by, mm. but no, Magnolia just clinched it, and possibly because I voted for it. <laughs> Which is fun because it's in my top four letterbox. Yeah, <laughs> um, but also Tom Cruise's best on-screen performance, hundred um, percent. But fuck you all for not letting me talk about Straight Story and um, uh, Summer Sam. Yeah, well, there's always, we'll still, knowing you, Adam, you'll still mention them oh, well, on the 99 special. So you have that to look forward to, but we're all going to be doing spooky season. So on the next pod, we're going to be talking about the Terrifier movies. Ugh. And clearly they have a fan base. Terrifier 3, it will be out in the cinemas by the time this podcast is out. Last Sunday, I sat and watched the first two for the first time. And it was going, maybe they'll, they'll, maybe they'll be good. Uh. You'll have to wait that podcast. And then I think because our festival, Dark House International Festival, 
is going for a witchy vibe this year. I think we need to do something witchy related. And we'll have another ramble. And I'm sure there's other spooky stuff we'll have coming. We'll have the crime scene to screen, guys. They are doing a conjuring special in the run up to Halloween. And if we can get her, because you know she's very busy with, um, fa- well, not finalised, now she's finalised her Titanic book. I'm um, hoping to do a Halloween time special for, we need to talk about Disney with Victoria Brown and Maria McQuillan. So hopefully that happens. Who knows? If it doesn't, it'll be me and you talking about Halloween now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. Oh, Debbie Reynolds. <sighs> oh, <Yeah>. oh. <laughs> everyone's favourite granny so yeah you've got that to look forward to as mentioned there's loads of episodes in the back catalogue you can seek out you can also find our YouTube on our YouTube channel previous episodes of the TV show with performances or performance with appearances from Nicole Hamilton of course Adam of course you were stepping in as a host Hi. you'd like you, Adam I could see you with your watchful eyes when we did the last TV show recording going yeah Jim's back I was better <laughs> I was just you know, in the last month, I've been on three times. <laughs> Jimmy's sick of seeing me. Yeah, there, there is that wee lad. Why is he come dressed as a joker every time? <laughs> See, I want to let the audience in on on a secret. I was going to come dressed as the joker for the joker review, and then I watched the joker too, and I went, I'm fucking embarrassing myself for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yous. Next week, you'll come. Next time, when we get you on as the last minute, we'll get you on as the terrifier. Uh, well, Fun. I'll leave all the terrifying stuff to next week. Yes, so you've that to look forward to. So on this rambly exit from this ramble cast, thank you very much for listening. All that's left for me to do now is thank my guests. So thank you very much, Adam Neeson. Thank you. And thank you very much, Dr. Nicole Hamilton. Thank you. And we'll be back next week with our ugh, terrifier special. You've that that to look forward to. But for now, until then, goodbye. Bye bye. <laughs>